But let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you brought us here to this place. First to worship you, Lord, in song, and now to worship you by studying your word tonight. And so, God, bring illumination to us, Lord, I pray. And through that, Lord, bring revelation into our lives this evening. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. Hey, we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight with Judges chapter 3, so please open your Bibles. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll give you one to use during service. And as you're turning there, for those of you who were with us last time through Judges chapter 2, um, it spoke to us a lot about um, what it means to be disobedient. Whew. Man, I'm glad I got through that chapter. It's not over. It's not over, gang. Um, Anytime you and I, we willfully, deliberately disobey the Lord, and then he sends a voice, maybe an angel, as he did to the children of Israel. More often for you and me, it's a voice of conviction from his Holy Spirit, is it not? Uh, that, that's when he speaks to me, it's like, Tom, you know, hello, what are you doing? That's the voice of conviction I get. It's like, hey, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? And, you know, the problem is with that is me, normally most of the time, is that I go through that warning from the Holy Spirit. If I pass by the warning of the Holy Spirit, then what happens eventually is that the sinning gets much easier to do. It's a fact. I know, because it's happened to me. The issue is, like here, as we're uh, going to be getting into chapter 3, the Lord sends a word to warn you and to warn me. He sends that word. And we have choices then to heed the word or not. And when we heed the word... The idea is, is that it is to convict you and me so that we won't continue forward in that plan. Normally your plan or my plan. Remember here in chapter 2, the Lord sent a very special messenger to the children of Israel. The angel of the Lord, that is which is called a Christophany. That is a picture of Christ, him coming a pre-incarnate to this place in order to send a warning and to send a message to the Lord's children. The Lord felt it was most important to send his son to give a warning, to give a heeding unto his children, the angel of the Lord. And the Lord does the same, I believe, for you and me too. It's for a purpose, gang. It's for a reason that he sends a warning an admonition, if you want to call it that. A caution light. It's like going through a street intersection. You have a caution light, not to tell you that the light's been green, but to tell you that the oncoming color is going to be what? Red. That's why we have caution lights in intersections. So, like too, the Lord sends His yellow light to you and me to give us a warning, to heed His word so that you and I won't continue through that intersection of decision. The, the, the Lord put a thorn, he says in his word in chapter 2. He put a thorn in the side of the children of Israel. i got to ask you guys, when was the last time you had a thorn on some part of your body? Ever grab a rose bush? And I was trimming rose bushes out here last week and those, man, those evil plants to the other side on the outside. They're just evil because they've got masked these little thorns and you try and grab them even through gloves and they go right through the gloves and, man, does it hurt. It hurts when you get stuck with a thorn. God here sends or leaves the, the Canaanite in the land so that it would be a thorn in the side of his children. It's not pleasant to have a thorn in your side. It's not meant to be pleasant. It's meant to 
remind you of something. Or maybe it's meant to test you in some way. And here God tells them through this thorn that they decided to follow another God. They decided to follow the God of Baal or the God of Ashtoreth. And we went over what they were last week. And God is telling them, listen, by this thorn, you will not find a more compassionate God than me. He's telling them by this thorn that you will not find a more loving God than me. He's telling them by this thorn that you will not find a more understanding God than me. That's the purpose of this thorn. And he says the decisions that you are going to make, these decisions you're making, will lead you into a life of misery and they'll lead you into a life of bondage. That's the purpose of this thorn. And when a child of God does this, you and I then are headed right into bondage, whatever that might be. Every one of us is a slave to something. Maybe for the youth these days, it's they're slaves to their cell phones and all those apps that they have on their, on their, fo- on their phones. Or maybe someone, they're slaves to Facebook. Just can't get away from having the Facebook updates and, ooh, what are they saying? And, oh, wow, someone, someone tagged a picture of me lately. Oh, man, isn't that wonderful? Maybe it's a slave to alcoholism, drugs, a relationship. We're all going to be slaves to something. Maybe it's our jobs. Maybe it's the almighty dollar, as they say. Whatever it is, you fill in the blank, whatever it is. We're all a slave to something. And God gives you and me the ability to choose and have a choice on which way to choose, which way to go. He clearly gives us an opportunity for choice, does He not? Does He not? Mm -hmm. And so by that very opportunity of choice, we then choose. Sometimes we choose the right path and sometimes we don't choose the right path. Remember that the children of Israel here tells us in chapter 2 that they wept. The issue is, is that they didn't have any godly sorrow because They didn't have a sorrow over their sin. The issue of sorrow was more so that they were caught. It's like, whoops, I'm sorry that I was caught. Maybe those of you who have children kind of go through that. They kind of go through that kind of sorrow. They were caught. They don't understand, maybe based on their age, the issue of true sorrow. The Bible says that godly sorrow is that of which leads to repentance. Repentance. And godly sorrow is one thing that when God busts me on something and I'm feeling terrible about it, I'm feeling remorseful about it, I'm feeling terrible about the rebuke that God has has levied upon me as a result of my sin, and when I'm truly, truly sorrowful, well then the response that I have is I repent. That's the idea. It's not that I'm sorry and I continue on in my sin. It's not that I'm sorry, oh Lord, I'm really sorry, yet I make no change in my life. That's why the scriptures say that the godly sorrow, godly sorrow leads to repentance. The difference is repentance. And as a result of this lack of repentance, With the children of Israel, the Lord leaves the Canaanite in the land to dwell among them to be a thorn and to test them. That's the purpose. That's the reason. And God is going to now use, understand this, this is kind of interesting. God is going to use their disobedience of all things. He's going to use their disobedience to work things together for good. 
You know, have you ever, has that ever happened to you? I mean, you know, something you do in disobedience and you're like quite amazed on, wow, it all worked out. What do you think, that was your thing? Think that was because of you? No, it was God. God using your disobedience to work things out together for good. Then there's the issue of his perfect will versus permissive will. Would have been perfect had you followed his will perfectly, but unfortunately you didn't. So he allowed you to go that way. But God is ultimately going to get the glory at the end. So he'll use those things. He'll even use your disobedience and my disobedience to work things together for good. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, because God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So God is not slack, as the Scriptures say, concerning his promises either. God leaves them in the land. He says, okay, you don't want to wipe them out? Guess what? They'll stay. They'll stay and they'll be a thorn to you. So God leaves them in the land to be a test to them and to test to see if they will walk with God or not. Oh, man, Pastor Tom, there are so many things in my life or there's this one issue in my life. Man, it just keeps coming back. It's like, okay, well, hey, this is something that, that you did not or, or you know, decide to give over to God early on, so now God is allowing it in your life. So now the test is, is are you going to walk with God with that thorn in your life? Are you going to walk with God now with the Canaanite in your land? That's kind of what it boils down to. Or not? Are you just going to cave in and and give over to that thorn, to that test? They have a choice. They have a choice to walk with God and to, to choose to walk with God. That means a lot to the Lord. To make a choice to walk with God It means a lot to him because you and I, I have the same choice as you do every single day to walk with God or not. Don't think Pastor Tom is anybody special or anybody different because I'm not. I go through the same struggles. I go through the same temptations. I go through the same issues. I have the same kind of mind that has captured things from the past and I have those things as well. But bottom line, when the rubber meets the road... I have the same choice every single day as you do. And like myself, you you can either commit the day to God or not. That's how I see it. It's pretty simple. Either commit the day to the Lord or not commit the day to the Lord. That's what's going to happen. When you don't commit the day to the Lord, then you'll see what happens. It's a daily thing, guys. It's not a weekly, a monthly, a yearly thing. You have a choice in this matter. God leaves the choice up to you. He's made you sovereign like He is sovereign, and so therefore you have the ability to choose. Am I going to commit this day to Christ or not in all that I do, in all that I think? The culture is bad enough. The culture of this world is is bad enough by having an option makes it even tougher. Wouldn't it be great if we were just like a bunch of God robots? Pre-programmed just to follow the Lord like a robot? Well, what is, there's no love in that. There's no choice in that. Love is a choice whether it's our relationship with God or whether it's a relationship within a marriage, love is a choice. There's a word in the Hebrew that I love, not like pizza, but I love it. It's a great word, and it's one of the four words in the Hebrew language, and it's called ahava. And it's one of my favorite words because it just rolls off the tongue, and it's very breathy. And what that word ahava means is it means love. It's a love that is meant 
out of a decision and a purpose to love. As in a marriage, as in a relationship, making a decision to love, a purpose to love. That is the way God loves you and me. So to make us like robots, there is no love in that, is there? There's no choice involved, is there? We would then be preconditioned and we'd be a bunch of robots. Choice makes it very meaningful to God because that means that you have chosen to love Him above all other things. Husbands and wives here tonight, Love God more than your spouse. Because if you choose to love God more than your spouse, then guess what? When your spouse, man, grinds you, and it's a nice little joke I have with Jean. I, she'll tell me something. I go, Jean, you're grinding me now. She goes, I'm what? Man, it's like when something goes on in your relationship as a husband and a wife, You need to have that purposed, decisive love born out of a choice. Otherwise, it's not love. You have a choice, and that means that there's no forcing involved. Forced love, according to the law, is called rape. And there is no love in rape. But God gives you and me a choice, a freedom of choice to love Him as He has freely chosen to love you. This book, the book of Judges, is all but almost over with the introduction of how the children of Israel got into the mess that they've gotten themselves into. In the book of Judges, we've talked about the book of Judges for a couple weeks now. So you're probably saying, okay, Tom, when do we get into the Judges? When is that going to start? Where are they, in fact? Where are the Judges? We're going to talk about three Judges this evening. But it was needful to understand why the children of Israel are in the situation that they're in and how they got themselves into that mess. So in chapter 3 of Judges, verses 1 through 6, it reads like this. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known of any of the wars in Canaan. Verse 2, that was, the, that was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know, to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians and the Hivites who dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Verse 5. Thus the children of Israel dwell among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Wow. A lot has changed from the time of Joshua, hasn't it? From a time of following God. But now we see that they've turned. And we, again, studied last week in detail how they have turned quickly from the things of God. And God yet giving them two opportunities of deliverance. They didn't take it. They didn't receive it. So God is saying, as we read in chapter 3, verse 1, that God is leaving these nations in the land so that they would know war, the Scriptures tell us. Not that they would know war for the strategies involved or the way war is plotted out and the way this is done and that is done and all that kind of war stuff that goes on. But for a child of God, like these children here, his children, the important thing is walking with God in battle. That's the important thing. 
And knowing that victory only comes when the Lord is leading you. That's the only time you're going to have victory in your life. Is when God is the one leading you and you're walking with Him. Not when you're walking alone. Not when you're walking according to the desires of your own flesh, of your own mind, of your own strength. That's the way it is. Think back in your own mind. Wow, the times that I have gone out on my own, gone out on my own limb and charged and mavericked my own trail, how it all ended up. I can remember in my own life things that I had done in my own life, in my own marriage. That was like, wow, Lord, I was really pretty dumb. Now, there's a, this, this, you see what was left in the land. Five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites dwelt them out, and so forth. Man, remember, these nations were left in the land, and they are a picture of sin. Because God said, go in, eradicate it. Expunge it, purge it, get it out of the land. Why? Because they will be a stumbling block to you, he said. Because what's going to happen is, is you will then end up coming alongside them and looking at the gods that they serve, looking at the way of their life and such and so on, and then you'll be attracted to that, you'll be tempted in that, and then you will fall into that idolatry, and sure enough, they have. There's a lot of sin that's left in the land of Canaan yet for the children of Israel to eliminate, but they're not going to. Likewise, it would be a lot of sin to be left in our lives too. A lot of sin. God is trying through these scriptures giving, to give us a real picture of of what it would be with sin in the life of a believer. That's what's going on here. They totally, as we've read, have given themselves over to the enemy or to, the, to sin. They're marrying their daughters. Their daughters are marrying their sons. And they're worshiping their gods. They've fully caved in. They've fully given themselves over to serve the gods of Canaan. You see how far they've gone in, in their own sin. These who have been raised in the ways of the Lord. They've been raised in the ways of God. You know, you and I, we have a bent, a tendency towards sinning. It's just in our nature, is it not? Without the governance of the Holy Spirit in your life, without the restraining of the Holy Spirit ruling over your life and my life, our tendency is to fall into idolatry of some kind. Whatever it may be, whatever it is. You see the progression. The Lord, uh, or, or they, put themselves next to the sin by having them in the land. So now they're living among them. So they're next to the sin. Then they become involved in the sin. And then they become given over to the sin. They're next to it. They become involved with it. And then they become given over to it. That's the progression of sin in any believer's life. If you get yourself too close to it, you'll be eyeing it. You'll be looking at it. And it will be a temptation for you. The next thing is you become involved in it. You become flirting with it. You become playing around with the sin. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself overtaken by the sin. And then you say, how did I get here? How did I end up in this place? It happens so quickly. That's the progression of sin. 
And this really complicated things for God. Oh, it complicated things for God in a major way. God being the head of his family and these being his children, it really kind of messed with his plan a bit. It's really grievous because God had said way back when to Abraham, Father Abraham, through your seed I will bless all the nations of the world. He said, through your seed, Abraham, I will bless every nation of the world. How? In bringing the Messiah through this line, through his children. That's how he would bless the nations of the world. But now look at what they've done. These children are throwing away their opportunity They're throwing away their opportunity for faithfulness to God. They're throwing away their opportunity to be used by God. They're kind of disqualifying themselves. And they throw it all away for sex. They throw it all away for idolatry. That's what they do. They get all wrapped up in that junk. And when God saved each of us, We're no different here. We're all the same. When God saved each of us, He saved us to save us because He loves us. That's why. And He wants and desires us to be forgiven. To be forgiven of our sins. But there's also, I believe, a purpose to our lives when... We are Christians. There's a purpose for our salvation. Otherwise, God would not, would you, otherwise, God would just leave you in the saved state of salvation, and that's it. You're saved. Hip, hip, hooray. I'm going to heaven. But you don't grow. You don't mature. What good is that, says God? I want you to be useful for me, he says. I want you to be living stones in my house. I want you to be worthy to be placed in my house, he says. You and I, we each have a purpose to our, for our salvation. There are folks, there are folks and, who get saved and as his children are saved, then they make a choice to glorify their lives. For Jesus, they make a choice. And it might be someone serving just in their children's ministry. And I don't say just, meaning demeaningly, but I mean in the children's ministry. Changing a diaper. There's no real glory in that, is there? Changing a diaper. But yet they make a decision to follow God. They make a decision to purpose their lives for God by changing a diaper in the nursery. And they continue doing that. And they continue serving God, serving God in a most humble way. But yet it glorifies the Father. There's a purpose for your salvation. The children of Israel teach you and me that it's kind of, I think, unfair to God and destructive for us to willfully be disobedient or to waver in the side of temptation because our world as it is is already becoming more Baal-like, more Ashtaroth-like in the way that it promotes Uh, promiscuity and and it promotes this lifestyle and this way of living that is, hey, let one live. Go ahead, live and let live. Whether you're two guys who want to get married or two girls who want to get married or living in in fornication uh, before marriage, you know, whatever it is, the world is saying, no problem, just go for it. You're not hurting anyone. Live and let live. It takes, I believe, a strong determination 
to follow the Lord. Strong determination to follow God. You have to be determined in your heart to follow the Lord. Otherwise, you and I will never know what God had in store for us unless we continue on His path in our lives. This book, I believe, really plows deeply. I mean, it plows deep into our lives. And this book, I believe, smashes head on into any disobedience that is in our lives. The idea of judges is to wake us up, kind of pour the cold water on our face, and say, you know what, I don't want this to happen in my life. That's the idea of judges. In verse 7, So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baal and Ashtoreths. One of the things that I see in that scripture is three words, in the sight. In the sight of the Lord. Remember, God watches. God sees everything you and I do. So God is watching our lives. This sin of what it's described and forgetting about God and serving these false idols is again, grievous unto God. It grieves Him. They, number one, they cease to worship God. Well, that's bad enough. Saying, I'm not going to worship you, God. But then they turn around and they worship other gods of all things. It's kind of a double whammy against the Lord. But then when you finally cry out to the Lord, He will send help. For you and me, He will send His Holy Spirit to our aid. And He will help us. Romans 5.20 says, But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So even in your deepest, darkest sin, there is grace. Because it's promised by God. There is grace. So hopefully, the longer we walk with Jesus then time gets shorter and shorter. Let me say this in verse 8. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan rishathaim king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served this guy eight years. I find that incredibly disappointing. Not only did they go into you know, God selling them into, so to speak, into this, to the hands of this guy. But it took them eight years to cry out to the Lord. Eight years. See, I pray that, that you and I, as long as we walk with the Lord, the longer we walk with the Lord, that it's not going to take you and me eight years to get over something. That it's not even going to take one day to get over something, but five minutes to get over something. That's my prayer. The longer we walk with Jesus, the shorter these issues, this time, should be. It's kind of parallel. It's kind of of parallel with it. So the, the longer we walk in the Lord, the shorter it should be that we recognize and we turn from it. And we cry out to God. Verse 9, it says, When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. Verse 11, so um, let's see here. Verse 10, so see, I already read that. No, did I? Did I read 10? No, I don't think so. I read 9. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over him. Verse 11, So the land had rest for forty years. Then Othniel, son of 
Canez died. See, the Lord is, is full of deliverance. He's full of grace. That word Othniel, his name means force of God. I like that. Force of God. Him being the younger brother of Caleb, him being the younger brother of Caleb, saw the example of his older brother. And so in that, man, what a great example. To God goes the victory. You see, and the main thing that I think we need to see here, as God sends a deliverer, this man Othniel, the main thing we see is when the Lord sent victory, it's because the Spirit, it says, of the Lord came upon him. That's the most important thing. The most important thing for anyone of being empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to be stirred by the Spirit. But it's quite another thing to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and have His power in your life, the power for victory, the power to overcome those things in your life. The power of the Holy Spirit that when it's needful in your daily life to overcome battles personally, professionally, or even in the ministry. The Spirit of the Lord. It's needful. I think one of the most needful ministries is moms. Man, they need the Spirit of the Lord every minute of the day to strengthen them from their little ones. So no matter whether you're a mom or whether you're a CEO or you're a pastor or you're changing diapers in the nursery, we all need the Spirit of God to enable us, to empower us, to do that of which He is called us to do. Verses 12 through 15, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms, that being Jericho. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Here's another example. Eight years, now 18 years they served, they served this guy. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, whoo, finally, huh, hallelujah, 18 years, they finally get it. The Lord raised up a deliverer, here's judge number two, for them, Ehud, raised up a, a Ehud, the son of Gera, a, the Benjamite, a left-handed man, By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Interesting part of Scripture here, I think. Right after the restrainer, the convictor, the Holy Spirit, that deliverer that God sends him, he dies. Guess what? The children of Israel, verse 12, again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Wow. How quickly they forget. How quick do you forget? How quick do you forget when God has been so faithful to you? And then when everything's fine, whoo, go right back to the way of life that you were doing before. Man, when will we get it? I pray for each of us. It doesn't take us 18 long years to realize that we're not in a good place. That God wants for you and for me to be in a better place. And without submitting to the Holy Spirit in our lives, in your life, without submitting to Him, without allowing Him to restrain us from sin, without allowing Him to convict us of the sin, guess what? Quickly, you will go back to the things that you were doing before. Mark my words. You will. So, they didn't learn the first time because it took them eight years. Now they... Didn't learn the second time, 18 years. But the Lord raised up a deliverer nonetheless. It's His grace. Because He loves His children. Verses 16 through 30. It goes on to say, Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was a double-edged and cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes in his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. I think it's interesting the scriptures say that. His name Eglon means calf-like. 
And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute, but he himself turned back from the stone images and word Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he kept silence, or keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in the cool private chamber. Basically, it was kind of a, a large bathroom. Okay, that's the scene. That's where we're at. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly, even to the hilt, even the hilt in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade, for it did not draw the, draw the dagger out of his belly and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out throughout the porch and shut the doors of the upper room from behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, well, he's probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited till they were embarrassed, and he had still had not opened the doors of the upper room. Remember, it was like a bathroom. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud, Ehud escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped uh, to Syria. To Syri Syria, And it happened when he arrived. He blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him to the mountains and, he, and led them. Then he said to them, follow, follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan, leading to Moab and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they killed about 10,000 men of Moab. All stood men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued the day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. That's the longest time that there was rest under the time of Judges. 80 whole years of rest. And so here what we see in this particular area is is this word Ehud means undivided. I like that because he's not divided in his thoughts. He's not divided on what he's going to do or who he's going to follow, but he is definitely following the Lord. Also, it's interesting that it says that he was left-handed because he was a tribe of Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Yet it was a lefty that was used, a southpaw that was used in this, in this time. I think it's kind of interesting. One of the things I see here with Ehud raises a question. Are any of us today, tonight, undivided and willing to, to kill the sin and be ruthless with it? If there's any sin in your life, are you willing to be undivided and say, No, Lord, this is sin in my life. I need to do what this guy did and stab it. I need to kill it. I need to be ruthless with it. That's what Ehud had done. He was ruthless with this king. It's interesting as this sword is described as a two-edged sword. You might call it a double-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Yeah, this guy's sword killed this guy. But the sword, the word of God, does way more than that. It tells us here in Hebrews 4.12 what it does. This guy Eglon, this, this guy that says, uh, a very fat man, a very large man. Well, he's a picture of sin. The amount of flesh on this man, and, and he's a perfect picture of sin. The old man. The old nature left over from Adam and Eve. An appetite that is voracious and an appetite that is hungry, that is sin. You feed it enough, then it's like Jabba the Hutt style, right? That's what happens. Starts off small, but then you feed it, feed it, feed it, feed it. It grows and grows, and it will overtake you. Just gets larger and larger. 
I don't, I don't have the strength. In fact, this guy, Cusheth Rishathame, back in verse 10, his name, he wasn't called that name by his mom because it means double darkness. That's what it means. So it was a name given by him by his exploits. He was, he was double dark. Not in complexion, but in his deeds that he did. A, a, a mean guy, a bad man. Hey, I don't have the strength personally to um, deal against the double darkness of sin. I don't even have the strength to deal against the darkness of sin. And I'll go on one step further as I struggle with a tan sin even. You follow me? I struggle with any hint of sin. I struggle with. But this is what the Word of God does in us. For every eglon, for everything that, of the eglons in your life that try to stumble you and try to gain momentum and try to be just hungry and be fed by you in your life and rise up in your life, you have the Word of God. You do. You have the Word of God. It tells us it is a double-edged sword piercing, able to, to go right through anything, you have the Word of God. What a picture. It says his entrails came out. But if you have a King James Version, it says that dirt came out. Interesting word. I was wondering, why does it say dirt? It doesn't mean dirt. It means excrement, feces. That's what it means. Is this not a picture of sin? Think about it. I know I've grossed you guys out. I'm sorry. But it's true. That's a picture of sin. And if you keep it in your life, that's what is growing. Getting all fat and just gross, and it is nothing but dirt. New King James is pretty political correct. Entrails, I like that. But in the Hebrew, it means something far worse. You see, and that's what sin is. That's exactly what sin is. So the Word of God is there to pierce it, to get it out of your life. That's the purpose. That's the reason. I love the picture. I love the illustration that God gives us by His Word. It's so cool. The last judge, the third judge, is after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, which is only about eight feet long, and he also delivered Israel. So God yet sent a final and another, the third in this line of judges. All is all we know about this judge. Nothing more, nothing less. And, but we look at what he's done. Wow, pretty amazing. Killing 600 men of the Philistines by himself. Kind of like a Samson moment. One thing I find really cool about this guy, though, is that he obeyed God with everything that he had. Listen to that. He obeyed God with everything that he had. All he had was an ox goad. He didn't have any sword. He didn't have any army. He had no chariots. He had no javelin. He had no piercing arrows. He had an ox goad. And God called him into battle with that. And he obeyed. When God calls you and me into battle, he gives you and me what is needful for victory. He knows. He knows what you will need. The reason why is so he'll get the glory. It can never be equal. Understand that. It can never be equal. God is always going to give you that which is most needful, and that's all. But you have to be obedient. You must be obedient to say, yes, Lord. 
God's lessens the odds for you. Yet it's greater for him. And when God calls you and me to do something, it's always slightly over my head. Have you ever noticed that? It's just, man, just not, it's just out of reach. I can't, I can't get it. It's just experience-wise or adequacy-wise or familiarity-wise or comfort-level-wise. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a struggle over something. Maybe it's something that's been in your life, and you're like, man, Lord, it's just slightly over my head, and I cannot get to it. I can't get to it, God. God says, exactly. I mean it that way. But I'll give you what's needful to go to battle. I'll give it to you so that I will be glorified. God always does that. We, you and I, we're always only five loaves and two fish. We always are. It's all we ever are. Yet, by God's grace, God will add the increase into your life. I believe it. He'll get the glory of the multiplying. He'll get the glory of the victory in your life. And as these guys come up, the worship team comes up, I just wanted to illustrate to you the final part of this message tonight with Shamgar that God added to Shamgar's faith. God added to his faith that which was needed to have victory and to glorify him. God did the work. In recap of these particular three judges, the first three of which we have read about, Othniel, understand, with Othniel, it shows us and it depicts for us the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we can, that you can, overcome the double darkness in your life with the Holy Spirit. Call out to Him soon. Don't wait eight years. Don't wait 18 years call upon the name of the Lord. Ehud. Ehud gives us an example of the importance of giving the Word of God a deep, penetrating place in your life. Giving the Word of God a deep, penetrating place in your life. And the last guy, Shamgar, not much, but he sure did a lot, that when God calls you to do anything, when He calls you guys or calls me to do anything, it, all we need is what he gives us and he'll do the rest. Do you know that? If you feel inadequate, if you feel like, man, you just don't have the experience, how am I going to overcome this issue? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? It's like, man, don't worry about it. Just obey him. Just obey him. Remember Shamgar, an eight-foot plank, basically. Six, 600 men he killed because he was obedient. You know, one of the things that the Lord put on my heart is we're just going to, and, and right now, for those of you, if you have children, you're free to go and grab your kids. I know the children's ministry is pulling their hair out. But, you know, um, I just want to leave this a time right now of, of, um, of just kind of calling upon the name of the Lord tonight.